um, some um, like in in uh, Limoncelli's uh, latest book on on cloud system administration, he says that uh, DevOps is more like a uh, eventuality that that has to happen if we want to keep up, kind of at a uh, at the correct scale for um, how we're moving. So, you know, it, and it's it's important to to remind everybody it's a it's a cultural movement. It's not just limited to, you know, something like oh you you can be DevOps without using Chef. You can be DevOps without having Puppet or continuous integration. But there's some patterns that that, have, that we've seen arise over the last uh, um, five years and. Um, and so, so I, I kind of answer it as in more of a holistic way of like where, where it's come from and how it's continuing to progress. Um, we see continued uh, pull in the ideas of like lean manufacturing um, and, and trying to treat the system uh, uh, kind of as, as total flow, less work in progress, less technical debt. Um, uh, there's the CAMS model that, that Willis and uh, Damon Edwards uh, came up with, which is uh, culture, automation, measurement, and sharing, and kind of the DevOps, uh, you know, influence all that. So I know it's kind of a long, kind of windy answer, and um, but but I, I see DevOps as kind of a continuation of uh, agile, uh, agile into the rest of the organization. So it kind of sounds like what you're saying is a living, breathing system, and there's a lot of components to it, from the people aspect to the to the tools they're using, um, and and that it's evolving. Yeah, we're we're wrestling away from like the um, should we do DevOps. I think we've seen um, in the both the DevOps the DevOps surveys that have been released by uh, Puppet Labs over the last uh, two years. It's an independent survey, tons of uh, research on it, but they're they're showing. Um, huge orders of magnitude gains from organizations that do DevOps. Um, we're seeing the continued desire of, of the business and, and other people in the organizations to increase flow and, and rate of change. Um, and I think that as a whole, the industry has sort of moved away from the, like, this DevOps thing is a fad, which is kind of the, the messaging in 2010, 11, maybe even into 12, and to now it's like, oh, we, we pretty much have to do this, right? This is not like, Operations 2.0. This is some. This is a completely new new approach to how we're um, how we're doing this. And this this is a uh, this is actually an enabler for us to to move faster, um, um, much like we we did with Agile, just kind of in our in our development practices, you know, in, in ten ten years ago. Yeah, which brings if up I a can, good point. Sorry, oh, go ahead. If no, I can I'll... interject really, if I can interject really quick, um, and to James' point about getting a, the increase in speed. Uh, we started doing DevOps Agile at the AppSec group within Pearson, and just to throw out some numbers, so we have some numbers, we did 44 assessments in 2014, and we will have done 200 by the time 2015 is over. Um, and w with the teams that we've integrated with, with the, we have a AppSec pipeline, as, as I have named it, um, with the teams that we've integrated with with the AppSec pipeline, we're having a 45% decrease in the time to remediate. So the, these numbers are real, and they're big. Yeah, it's it's. I mean, that's quite a pace to keep up with. Um, but uh, I mean, that sounds sounds like you guys are fairly successful with keeping up with that pace. Um. <laughs> Not for all of Pearson. Pearson is huge, but for the bits that we've integrated with, yes. <laughs> Trust me, there's there's still lots of work to do. Yeah, and I guess that's the whole point of you know what we're going to talk about is you know kind kind of how how, how what do we what do we sort of break off and and try try to prioritize and and, and whatnot? So um, I guess that uh, that you know I'll tell you what Matt uh, since you chimed in I'll field the next question to you which is uh, you know as an application security engineer um, what what is your primary responsibility are you, are we talking about just securing application code or are we talking about things like you know searching uh, to make sure that you know credentials aren't paste it up to uh, Pastebin or GitHub or uh, something like that, or, um, you know, uh, that the frameworks people are using are up to date or uh, that you have uh, some sort of IR policy in place should one of your applications get hacked. I mean, what's your, what's your overall responsibility look like? Uh, it's, it's, it's changed based on where I've been employed. Uh, currently at Pearson, we're really just um, application itself. We don't really do any infrastructure. Um, and, and Pearson has a big enough CISO org that they actually have an ISOC that does the kind of paste bin looking around and those things. Um, but that said, when I was at RAC doing the product security group, we did 
look through GitHub, and we, we even wrote a little quick and dirty tool to sort of scan through our internal GitHub for, you know, SSH keys and those kind of whoopses. Um, and the infrastructure was also in scope for us at Rackspace. So at, at Rackspace and the product security group, it was pretty much whatever it took to make that product happen was in scope for our team. Um, so it, it really, I think it depends on the, um, it depends on the team and honestly the size of the team. Because uh, honestly, you know, you can have the most rugged, uh, reliable application launched on unhardened hardware and all of your hardening on the app side really doesn't do you any good and vice versa. You know, you can have a, a, a well-hardened system that launches a completely uh, weak and pwnable application and you're no better off. So I, I, to me, it's more of a, a political organizational question than a technical question um, because you have to do both. It's just a matter of how many people and how you want to slice up that pie. Okay. That makes Does anybody else want to chime in? Ken, I'll, I'll chime in from a, a much smaller company perspective uh, here at Invoca. Um, we're about 100, 150 employees, so I'm, I'm actually the only security engineer, so uh, I don't even have the title of application security engineer. So we wear uh, a number of hats, so um, everything from product security, sales calls, marketing material around security because this, you know, being secure is a thing you can sell your product based on, um, and even a little bit of physical security here at the office. So it's been a, a pretty wild ride, but basically um, it has a lot to do with automation. If I can set up a tool to go scour GitHub or Pastebin or those things to look for low-hanging fruit, I definitely set that up quickly. Um, I have kind of bigger fish to fry. We have enterprise customers now that come in and they just want to grill us on on everything that we do. They want to use our product, but their um, requirements are, are, the bar is really high. So they outnumber me by quite a bit. So we've kind of built out a security council here and I have handpicked kind of individuals from, from each team that can really help our security infrastructure grow without actually hiring more security engineers. So that's a, I mean, that's a brilliant that's a brilliant point about automation. By this is Matt. I'm sorry, I have to chime back in, but that that is even even with we had 12 people at Rack and we have 10 people at Pearson in the in the product security and AppSec team, respectively. And even with those, we have to do tons of automation. Totally. And, and, and I, I I completely commend you for uh, reaching out to to friendly partners to expand your reach because one of the fundamental things that I've realized is there will never be a big enough AppSec team or security team for that matter. So if you're not making friends with the other parts of the business, you're really doing yourself a huge disservice. And having worked at both large and small shops with, I'd say, definitely adequate security teams, it's allowed me to sort of focus. And I think there's a lot of benefit that can come from that focus. You know, if you're an engineer that has to think about everything, as opposed to an engineer that only has to think about a small subset of things, it's really easy to clear your head and focus on what's important and sort of ignore what you, I wouldn't say that you're not responsible for, but that you have the trust that someone else is capable of, of performing well in that area. Yeah, you have to be you have to be careful of uh, sort of handling the latest and the loudest thing if you're a one-man show, which I, I had that years ago when I was at TEA, and yeah, it's, it gets interesting. I don't. I don't envy you. Sorry, Jimmy. If you're, you know, you're no. uh, a one. It sounds like a which you know is a you know be, besides the and this is in a kind of a segue into the the next piece here. I mean, so you're a one man shop. Um, I'm sure you're dealing with a, a ton of code changes a day. Is automation the only way you're sort of solving that that problem? Um, automation helps. Uh, Honestly, I, I'm, I've been here about three months, so my, my focus has been getting to know developers, the product, why things were built the way they were, um, starting to, starting to uh, employ a bit of automation in the pipeline. But, um, you know, really, it's, for me, it's been getting developers and the rest of my teammates excited about security and having them going to find the bugs uh, before it even hits the code base. So that's an interesting, you know, piece. That's 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 kind of you bring you bring up a good point. I mean, it's not just the technology piece. And Matt, you sort of touched on this, where you know it, it's really it sounds like it's it's a lot of relationship building within your organization in terms of, you know, um, 
between whatever you know development teams between operations uh, does that hold true for for uh you know uh Justin, I'm going to pull you into this conversation. Do you believe that holds true? Is that uh, you know a good technique? Um, are there others? Yeah, so I um, I totally agree with that. And you know, there I think the comment that you will never have a big enough security team is absolutely accurate. You need to have sort of security spread over your entire organization. And at SurveyMonkey. I'm not exactly a one-man team, but um, it's just a few of us doing security. And I'm not great at it, but I'm really trying to push towards, like, let's get people involved. Let's get people interested. And as people get interested, certain people will sort of it'll become obvious that you know they're interested in security. They want to be involved. And instead of, you know, the first thought is, well, OK, add them to the security team. But I think the better approach is wherever they are in the organization, they're representing security. They can be the ones to, you know, raise the red flag to say, oh, you know, you really shouldn't do it that way, or you know, this seems suspicious. We should talk to the security team. And I think that's how you're able to scale, uh, rather than trying to hire lots of uh, application security engineers. Well, the other important aspect of that too is when you're engaging with the other parts of whatever your business is, is to figure out what their needs are and how you can dovetail the, you know, the security work that you want done into their needs. So years ago, I had the benefit of working for Wendy Nather, um, and I was the AppSec guy in that in that organization, and we were trying to get them to use a standardized, honestly, a set of regexes so that at least our inputs were validated somewhat and they were consistent just from a data quality point of view. Um, I sold this to the PMs as, hey, if you use this library, you guys do less coding. I sold it to the devs as, hey, if you guys use this library, I'll stop beating you up about, you know, uh, um, you know, data quality and, and injection attacks. Right? And we walked around and sold it to different, and we sold it to the CISO as, or the CIO, excuse me, as, hey, look, this will make us work faster because we're not going to have n implementations of the same silly thing. It, it was my goal was to make it more secure and get some consistency across all of our apps. But I didn't sell it that way. I found out what the group that I was speaking to heard and spoke that. And I think that's a huge. Sometimes we have a a a, a problem of wanting to achieve our goal, which is a good thing. But if you're not, if their goal is not doesn't resonate with who you're talking to, you, you know, you got the Charlie Brown want 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 teacher going on. They won't they won't hear you. Yeah, it's nice to think that security, you know. From what I've seen, that's that doesn't seem to be the case. Where it's you know you, you, you're like, well, security says this, so it must be something we should do, and that's just it's it's not reality. And so yeah, that makes sense. So you you know you kind of have to yeah, I would agree with that statement. Uh, anybody have it any all comes down to like building the culture of security and like security is not like something you have to do. It's just part of your job. And correct code is secure code, and correct code is what we're all striving for. So I think really like. Making sure that security is part of correctness builds a culture of security, and it plays into everything we've said. That's a good point. It's yeah. really just and, standard. Yeah, and and I think that the the really cool thing, and really, um, I don't know if I'm jumping the gun on this, but the really cool thing about uh, where security sits in the organization is um, operations has already made the same jump that security is attempting to make. Um, you know, if, if you rewind the clock, you know, five, six years ago, it's like operations and development were like, you know, uh, two two separate things and never like crossed over. Um, and, and operations was struggling to get uh, people to care about the concerns and worries that they have, right? Like uh, performance and availability, reliability. Um, and, and, and now like we see kind of that shift, right? Um, and so we, we sort of have somewhat of a template or some sort of guidepost to look at, you know, how operations did the same thing um, that security is kind of attempting to do inside of organizations. Interesting. So um, I think what I'd like to do now is shift, and, and thanks, James, um, and everybody so far. I mean, this has been... Yeah, very, very good stuff. Um, and what I'd like to sort of segue into and shift into is, is talk a little bit about um, the 
techniques and technology aspect. Um, you know, maybe some concrete examples of, uh, you know, some automation. So I think Neil, I've not picked you out for a question yet. So I'm going to, I'm going to throw that one to you. I can rephrase the question. Uh, you know, talking about automation, talking about how to, how to, um, let's talk about, you know, secure code for, for now, um, automating checking, you know, for, you know, basically reviewing code or whatever it is you do, um, uh, to, to prevent, you know, insecure code from getting out there. You know, do you want to sort of talk about techniques you've used in the past that work? Um, some concrete examples for the audience. Sure. Um, so in this modern, like, continuous delivery, continuous integration system, you have an almost infinite number of points you can hook into the system without getting in anyone's way. Um, I think when I first joined Twitter, one of our first projects was putting Breakman in the deployment pipeline and blocking any deploy that introduced new vulnerabilities. And that was an absolute failure um, because nobody likes to have their deploys blocked. And when you have a continuous integration a uh, continuous delivery system, the amount of time a potential bug is out in the wild is pretty minimal. So getting in the way is not a good idea, in my opinion. Sort of sitting back to the side and keeping an eye on everything is very, very effective. Um, and again, because you have so many points to integrate with, you have so many opportunities to integrate tools. Again, I mentioned Breakman. Uh, I know Matt, or actually he mentioned something else, but just throwing in a system of regexes is often incredibly effective. Um, for example, at Twitter, again, we, the, the Scala uh, web framework they had built was very limited, so we didn't need static analysis for Scala. We just had a couple of regexes looking for some bad APIs as we sort of removed those bad APIs. So definitely, like, throwing everything and the kitchen sink at a problem is a good way to approach it because the people who are going to be reading these results, us, typically are very good at filtering away a lot of the noise. So it's okay if these things are a little noisy. And obviously, you want to reduce the noise. But the more information you get back without making anyone's life more difficult is an incredible return on investment. Yeah, I'd like to jump in. I, I worked uh, at Rack with the container as a service product uh, before I left. And I was part of the, well, that was one of the teams I was working with closely. But one of the things I did for them is figure out the end number of things that were very crucial for a container in terms of security. I mean, these are mostly syscontrol. Um, and some of the uh, um, security options with the, oh shoot, what's it called, whatever it is. Anyway, a bunch of security options and number of security things that needed to be set for containers. And I wrote a Jenkins job that would go in every time there was a check-in and we'd pull a container. Um, we'd pull the code, build a container based on it, launch a container, drop this little bit of code onto the container, you know, poke around, do the end number of security checks to make sure this baseline was there. And if it was, great, we're green. If there was a problem, it's okay, we're red. Um, and that was ridiculously useful because, one, I sort of established you must be this high to ride the ride. And it wasn't perfect security, mind you, but it was good. Um, and it was automated, and it was easy. And the developers know, you know, what to do when there's a red job in Jenkins. And, you know, this is not anything out of the normal development process. And they, they, it, was, it was funny to me when I left the uh, rack space and the container team, for that matter. Uh, they actually were sad to see me go, and I thought, this is a, a brave new world where a dev team is like sad to see an AppSec guy leave. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can totally uh, relate to both of you guys. Um, you know, we use, I mean, everywhere I've worked uh, has used Jenkins in some way, shape, or form. So uh, what I've always done is just spin up my own security slave, let it do its thing out of band, like Neil was saying. Um, get your results, you know, run Breakman, runs, we're using OWASP, Zap, uh, the, the really great API. Um, you know, abuse your code there and don't get in the way of developers. Groups and show them the, I mean, in Jenkins, there's a, gra a plugin for Breakman. I don't know how up-to-date it is, but it is, but it is, but it is, but at least they don't like seeing red things. So they'll come talk to you and ask how to fix it and false positives and that really starts the conversation and you don't have to get in the way of deployment. Yeah, yeah another thing, I, oh, go ahead, I'm sorry. Yeah, if I can just comment, so, you know, Neil and I have talked a lot about what we did at Twitter and in terms of, you know, staying out of people's way and in sort of the, you know, a couple years since then, 
Um, it seems to me that the smaller shops that are, for example, dropping in Breakman early on in sort of their development, they have no fear of putting security tools in the way of development. And it's just, you know, they're used to using linters, they're, they're running style uh, tools. And so dropping in a security tool to them is actually not that big of a deal. So I would say if you're like a small shop and you're just starting out, just get security in the way of deploys. If you're a large shop and you're trying to introduce security, then it's better to take the sort of off on the side approach. Well, I, I think you, you make a valid point there. When I worked at TEA, we were a, a Hibernate shop in Java. And there's a couple things that are really, you shouldn't do with Hibernate, but generally Hibernate's pretty safe for SQL injection. So what did we do on check-in? We wrote a bit of code that basically grepped for these couple of banned functions, and we would fail you on those banned functions on, on code check-in in the case of, well, we were not CICD at TEA, not even close. Um, but that was a, that was a for me, it was a, it was a test that had zero chance of false positive and was definitive. You know, and those are the kind of tests that I think if you, if you have a ability to, to break a build or to, to raise a red flag or stop something, those are really what you have to do. One of the things we've done at, at Pearson is the first time we run kind of any tool against something that we're even considering, you know, putting into Jenkins or something like that is we'll run it a couple times manually to tune it and understand how noisy it's going to be. And it's only when I'm really, really sure that that thing's going to alert for something real that I will automate it and, and actually, you know, raise a flag, shoot an email, break a build, whatever the right case is, depending on the dev team. But I think you're right. You can break it if you're really confident it's it's real and it's a significant issue. And I love your point about doing it early because if you get it in early and it's just sort of what happens and it's it becomes the norm, then you're right. No one's afraid. Yeah, I think there's really a, a it depends on your culture. And I think for it seems to be becoming more common that people are just used to oh yeah, I, I push up my code and then like even if for example, the test pass. There might be some auxiliary tool that will fail me for some reason. And it just seems like for those types of shops, people are less sensitive uh, even about false positives. Does anybody else have any uh, <clears throat> um, you know, other methodologies or techniques that they, they use? Uh, I think we've covered, honestly, uh, a good portion of that, but if anybody else hasn't has a thought that they they haven't shared uh, before we move forward, please throw it in now. On the, yeah, on the I think. Oh, go ahead, go ahead, James. Sorry. Oh yeah, I know. Hey, Matt, you're okay. I, I was just gonna say, I think that um, a lot of the things we're talking about, like it has to fit with the culture that you're in. I think that's one of the the crucial uh, pieces. Um, Neil's point about how you know we're in a rapid change environment, so like. Um, doing things like slightly out of band, like um, you know, maybe if if you're into if you're the group you're in is like does a lot of chat ops, like push uh, you know push something in uh, uh, Slack or HipChat or, or IRC or whatever, and um, and and, it, and not everything has to. Uh, sometimes I think we as security engineers um, want to make uh, make everything perfect, and uh, we have to kind of resist that that desire sometimes, and uh, and put things as like you know out of band to kind of get to learn how to trust it, and then you can sort of um, break the build, or or maybe not break the build, maybe just you know fire alerts to the right people, um, and and be understand you know just try to like figure out how you integrate inside your organization that, that makes sense, and and don't try to do it, um, don't, you know don't go for the full uh, answer up front. Uh, to get, I think, uh, like at Pearson, we're 40k employees and 2,000-ish apps. Like to do stuff at, at crazy scale like that, um, you have to sort of decide what the right level is. And and I I think your idea and I think your your point about not being perfect is really crucial. Uh, there's a few really uber scary things that we know of at Pearson that they get the full Monty and they get everything and they get a manual test and we just make time for those. But there's a lot of things that just don't risk-wise rate that. And we ended up with a three-tier system of how we uh, rank apps into tier one, two, or three and it's just basically levels of rigor of how well and how much testing we're going to get. And if you're a level three, you're going to get our automated stuff and we're not filtering false positives and we're going to give you kind of a smell test and that's all we can afford to do. Right, and I think that the the at some point you have to give up the fact that you can never have perfection. I think the, the this high to ride the ride thing that I did with the container group is hugely valuable. So, 
So, I, sorry, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, sorry, I talked a lot about this already, but um, I think, you know, in terms of like concrete steps for people to take when they're thinking about automating security, um, you know, I, I think going along with the not being, you don't have to be perfect, is to just like, instead of thinking what what is this perfect system I can put in place, is to look at what is just like one problem I can solve with automation. Just one security issue that I can write a test for and put that into CI and then that problem goes away. Instead of sort of the, okay, I have to build like the perfect tool that's gonna catch all this stuff or I need to buy some enterprise level analysis tool and it's gonna do all this stuff. And I think it's really helpful to just focus on one problem and implement a simple solution to that one problem. But I, the talk I gave at AppSec US and also at LastCon and the training I did at both those conferences, I almost felt disingenuous doing it because I showed them the final product of our AppSec pipeline, but that was after a year of work and where for three months of the year, myself and another senior guy, as we called it, went meta. And all we did is write tools to make us go faster and the rest of the people did the, the air quotes normal work, right? Um, and I, I think your point about picking a thing and then iterating is a such a huge win. And, and I would even argue that maybe it's not your most risky thing, but if it's something you can easily automate, like the easy one I can think of off the cuff is SSL cipher strength. Those are like ridiculously easy to check. Well, automate that and just make that the norm and then pick your next something and then pick your next something. And that's basically how we got, I mean, I, I have a nice graphic of the final version of the pipeline and that's great, but that didn't happen like in a day, that happened over the course of a year adding on little pieces like building a Lego set. Yeah, I think that's really common with DevOps. Um, you see like the beautiful final product and then you go, oh, I really want that. And then <laughs> you get stuck at the first step because you're like, well, how do I get from zero to that beautiful thing that I saw someone present? <laughs> exactly. And it, you know, the, the realization is we started in January kind of, I had a, a rough outline of what we wanted to do, but we had really no more than that. And we just kind of, and it's like the Kanban um, kind of, or the, what's it, oh shoot, why can't I think of it? The, where you, you pick a goal and you sort of shoot for it and you don't have a straight line to it, like the kata of Kanban or of uh, DevOps, where you, where you, in essence, keep iterating. You, you know your end goal is to have automation of your AppSec program. That was our goal. We really didn't know what to do it. We had one guy start on sort of the intake side. I started on the output side. And we just kind of worked our way towards the middle, and we're not even there yet. We're close, and we're a heck of a lot further than we're going to be, but we'll honestly never get there, because as you fix and iterate on one thing, you find the other something that's now a pain point. And to go back to your point, Matt, about how you said you spent three months building this thing while everyone else did something else, like, those three months probably produced way more than, the, you know, way more output than the time you would have spent doing everything manually. That's the great thing about these tools, that the more time you put into them, the more time you get back, the more time you can focus on the things you couldn't focus on before, the more time you can focus on automating things that you didn't think you could automate before. That's really a key portion, and it, it was it was interesting because part of it, like I said, we're, we're a big shop. We have a handful, I think, six people that are offshore, um, and uh, they're not senior people, to be blunt, um, but they're good guys, and they do decent work. Um, and I've, I heard one of the teammates complaining about the offshore people, like, God, oh, these offshore people, they, they, they muffed this one thing, whatever it was. I said, wait a minute, like the whole reason that we were able to go meta for three months is because to the business, the offshore people are producing. Now, maybe not producing at the highest rate or the highest quality, but they're producing. And I think the full reason I and uh, Adam were able to go meta for three months was the fact that the business didn't see us go dark. Um, and that's that's a huge thing. And the, the, the awesome thing, too, about like shaving off some of these uh, uh, these rough edges or avoiding the paper cuts is you get that benefit when you do it the first time and then for everybody else on the team they also get that benefit so like you said if you can go I would have done I don't know in three months I don't know I don't know 12 20 assessments maybe um, and we got way more than that out of the automation that we put in place and uh, again to chime in from the the small shop here uh, Honestly, pizza and beer have become very valuable tools in my uh, in my art in my arsenal. Um, like seriously, though, we host all these uh, after hours. Um, the recent 
uh, we called it Hacktober for Cybersecurity Awareness Month. We were watching hacker movies in the basement and doing demos of social engineering and then doing uh, open labs at night on how Zap works, how to you know test for SQL injection. Uh, this stuff has been really valuable because it kind of spreads like wildfire. We have developers coming up to my desk saying, I want to hammer my application before I push it to production with all this stuff that we talked about last night. And, you know, it's kind of putting it in their hands, and um, it's pretty quick, and it's honestly fun for everybody. So that kind of stuff has helped us uh, at least gain some traction, and everyone knows, you know, we have things going on after hours, during work that are, you know, it's a little outside of their regular their job specs. So that's been really fun, too. And that naturally transitions into those people spread out throughout your organization who are sort of like your liaisons that you and Justin had talked about. It just yep. easily fits in. So um, I guess I'll shift gears then a, a little bit. Um, and, you know, by the way, I, I mean, I agree, you know, having done this before, honestly, the relationship building is so key training. I mean, that is a form of training, what you're talking about, Jimmy. Jimmy. So um, yeah, that's, those are, I can speak from personal experience saying those things you know, and say those things work. Um, so I, I guess I'll shift gears a little bit. Um, so OWASP, uh, I'm just picking them out as an organization because um, they've built a lot of policies over the years um, around application security. Um, and this isn't necessarily a comment on, like not asking anyone to comment on, you know, their the efficacy of uh, keeping up with the latest development standards. But we, we all know that there's a lot of policies out there kind of geared towards your, your larger waterfall, uh, slower development shops. So, um, you know, from your personal experience, um, I guess we'll start with, you know, what are, the, what are the challenges that differ for somebody who's come, let's say you've come from a, a one of those larger shops, one of those waterfall shops, and you're used to doing things a certain way, maybe following a certain SDLC, and you know, you're know you you're in Jimmy's shoes or you're in Justin's shoes, and day one you have to, you have to figure out the next 30 days game plan. Um, you know, what challenges do you think you're going to, not just challenges, but what, what, what differs and, and what should you be thinking about? I think that's where I want to sort of um, help folks that haven't been in that, you know, that, that uh, haven't been in this uh, environment before kind of get used to. So, uh, James, I'm going to bring it back to you and, and uh, you know, any insights that you have. Um, I know it's like a broad question, by the way, but it's, you know, <laughs> it's not the easiest answer, but yeah. Well, actually, I was wondering, um, could do we have Jimmy take a crack at it first? Sure. Yeah, Jimmy. Sure. Yeah, um, <laughs> definitely. Uh, so uh, in kind of the agile, SaaS, small startup world, uh, for me, the most important thing, what I'm discovering is the ability to have quick and educated security decisions, um, being able to identify what areas of your application and your environment are super sensitive and which ones aren't. Uh, and, you know, because I find here that this feature can be the whole talk of the office in the morning and it's something that we're just going for. And then it's like old news by the end of the day. So um, adaptation and just keeping an ear to the ground and, you know, sitting in on as many meetings as possible and understanding your application inside and out as well as the customers that you serve, what they're using it for. Uh, that's been super helpful because you don't have time like in the waterfall world to just, you know, I'm going to spend a day doing a pen test on this feature. Um, you got to decide now or they're moving along without you. And, uh, you know, which is good. And then, you know, again, people include you in those conversations the more you include them in, in your security world. So it kind of is give and take. Yeah, I think I, I, I. Sorry, I kind of like deferred on, on Jimmy there, but I, I really feel like Jimmy has a good, good grasp for like, as you're trying to like, prag, you know, pragmatically go about that. Um, you know, I, I would couple like there's there's some needs for, um, um, 
there, there's needs both on impact you know, kind of in the development process and then I think like operational um, insight you know in these fast moving environments like um, uh, you know able to understand what what is actually uh, you know going on um, with with the application or the stack with you know real customers that are using it like um, we've talked about a lot of feedback loops in the development process so you check in code goes red or whatever but similarly um, operational tooling um, has, has a good benefit of, of showing kind of a feedback loop uh, to development teams um, so like oh this our login page is you know seeing you know an increase of spikes of uh, cross-site scripting attempts or or you know invalid logins or, or whatever like like uh, uh, security type um, events that we see is important um, but that's also able to feed this back and uh, we saw this too with operations, right? Operations um, started, you know, in DevOps it was like, oh, let's put everybody on call and let's have that feedback loop, you know, change hands from just, you know, operations people have to deal with the problem to like, oh, now everybody gets gets woken up and the monitoring sort of does um, additional validation instead of just going to this, you know, one siloed team. It, it's kind of being being federated uh, throughout. So um, I, I think that's another another way to to help expose. Um, you know, application security or other types of security events, um, not just kind of leaving it, um, you know, siloed to that team, but also figuring it out outbound um, operationally, not just uh, development side. I, I think this is Matt. I think I had a, a pretty big uh, aha moment when I went from the, well, the last place I worked prior to Rackspace, uh, in between there as a consultant, but um, the prior to Rackspace, the last internal AppSec job I had was at a very waterfall shop. And Rackspace is very not waterfall. The, the most progressive uh, dev team when I was there was deploying 75 plus times a week, right? And and I had to sort of sit down and, and realize that these preconceived notions of how things should be, and there's this magical point that honestly never happens in reality where I get a week to actually test this thing. It just, just doesn't exist. Like, write that off and remove that assumption from your thinking. Um, and then start to really think about how you can get visibility and understanding of the security posture of the thing that you're working with, right? Um, and understand what the real, I think that I've heard this point raised a couple times, the real crucial aspects are because you can't eat the whole elephant, so you have to pick the bits that are very important. Um, and I know for me, like I, I, the flip side of that too is that with this team that did 75 deploys a week, we had one guy testing it. Um, one guy on our team, and he found an issue, and he jumps on IRC with that team there in California. We're in San Antonio. Pings him and says, hey, I found an issue with da 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 If I do this, this bad happens. Okay, cool. Can you send me the, you know, the HTTP and give me an example? And he did. And the guy said, thanks. And, okay, whatever. And he keeps testing. Ping on IRC a few minutes later. He's like, hey, what's up? He's like, I fixed it. What do you mean? He's like, I pushed it to production. It's fixed. So before we even wrote up a vulnerability... That thing was fixed, so we, in essence, opened and closed a bug on that product, you know, at the same time. So the flip side of this real great speed, um, which which seems that initially coming from a waterfall shop like the end of the world, <laughs> is actually something really cool, because now these problems that used to be months and months of arguing with when can I fit them in, it's an argue of like, hey, a sprint from now, which is two weeks, can I get this fit into you as one of your, you know, uh, objectives for the sprint, right? This is, it completely changes the game. So it, the one, I think, benefit that security people should think about if they are working at the sort of a DevOps agile speed is that these problems can be solved quickly, right? So, and, and Neil raised this point, you don't have to answer, fix these things right away. And, and I think if you have a very uh, uh, quickly moving dev team, you may actually stopping them in the midst of wherever they are in their momentum may be worse than letting it ride for a day or two and getting it fixed. Uh, I can remember when I was a consultant, a particular entity had SQL injection on their login page for a year before they managed to get it fixed in their very slow-moving waterfall shop, which is horrendous, <laughs> right? So yeah, I think the flip side is if you can let go of the everything must be perfect and I'm going to have this magical that never exists window where you have a full week to just isolate yourself and work on just an app, like drop those assumptions, understand what's crucial, and start working on it, and understand you're going to iterate. I mean, that's probably the biggest thing. Like, I, I've given up the, the idea that I'm ever going to have a perfect security program or even close to it. I'm just always going to have a continually getting better one. And I think that's a, a key sort of mindset. And the other thing I think 
that's super crucial is the worst thing you can do, particularly in a fast-moving shop, is pass on false positives. The whole DevOps idea of like passing on defects is terrible. I think a defect for an AppSec program is a false positive. And why should you burn your expensive developer time proving you false? Like you're not doing your job, to be bluntly honest with you, if you're an AppSec guy passing down false positives. Like that's your role. Otherwise, I'll just get, you know, name your commercial scanner, click next five times and print a PDF. Like, you know, that's, <laughs> that's not much better. Um, I think that's a really, it's a, it's a big thing to sort of let go of the idea that you'll ever do a complete something. And I love the idea of, of the thing we're working on at Pearson now is trying to parcel off these things into long and short running tests and then integrating them at different parts. Like I want to take, I want to do an exploded diagram of a normal web app pen test in essence and take all the pieces out, figure out how long each of those pieces run and then run them at different times. I mean, that's sort of my next, I don't know, that's a 2016 goal is how can I break down all these tests into individual a la carte things and then run them in parallel and maybe loop the ones that run quick and maybe run the ones every week that take a long time and then net the results into something smart. Like the, we use ThreadFix in our current case right now to, to net those things into every tool we have produces results. Those all get fed into ThreadFix and I can tell you, you know, right now today, actually we have a chat bot. I can tell you right now today that application X has so many highs, so many crits, so many lows. Done. And it's because we sort of lined up and, and dropped the idea of having these uh, sort of traditional AppSec program ideas of a week of where you just focus on X, we focus on the, the crucial things for the app that we have the time to look at at the time. And risk-based is huge, like getting the visibility to understand um, where, the real, where the real problems are is huge. Yeah, to go back to the shop math about uh, you know like the waterfall methodology and how you're never gonna have a week to look at something straight. Like honestly, I don't ever want to look at something for a week straight. I would rather review a thousand one line changes than one thousand line change. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> and it's so much easier. To, like the the time it takes you to throw away a, a a three line change in terms of like this doesn't matter from a security perspective is a couple of seconds. Absolutely. It also lends itself to sort of the static analysis diff method because it's very easy to see like what changed. And and sort of the last waterfall shop I was in, uh, we didn't do any static analysis. We just threw dynamic tools at the problem like you know a week before it shipped and see what happened. That's terrible. Yeah, and then uh, let's start the panic. <laughs> <laughs> right. Because of course you don't want to be running those tools mid development cycle because oh well we'll fix it we'll fix it it's not ready yet it's not done yet. Yep. Well, and we did a little bit of this at Rack with OpenStack, where for some of the scarier bits, we could identify using threat modeling the scarier bits of pieces of OpenStack. And then for those pieces, the normal sort of mantra was to use Garrett and have two developers plus one a code change, then it would go in. Well, for the scary bits, we just turned it up to plus three. Did, did that assure us that we had significantly increased security review of those changes? No. But I got three Clueful developers say, I don't see any problems, which is way better than what we had before. Just to mention, Wicket uh, quoted me on Twitter and saying developers don't like seeing red things. I didn't even realize I said that, but that kind of uh, <laughs> brings home the point to what you guys are all saying is like, we, I mean, at Invoco we hire really smart developers and they actually take pride in what they're doing. So if they see and understand the security vulnerability in that, even if it's a low or medium, um, they don't want that on, you know, weighing on them. So the things I've seen turned around here and in other kind of more agile DevOps shops, like I don't even have the chance to write the ticket up and somebody comes over and they're like, don't worry, it's taken care of. That will never happen again. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's really cool to watch that kind of iteration happen. Um, I don't have to wait a month or, and I don't really have to fight. It's, you know, that's the kind of the state of security that we're in and it's much better than it was even five years ago. So, I mean, it sounds, it sounds a lot like, so there's, there's a, and that's a point that I, you know, personally want to touch on is it doesn't seem like, and Matt, I mean, you'd, you'd, uh, spoke to this where it's like, um, if, you know, for a year you have a SQL injection vulnerability in your app, like your app's probably a piece of garbage uh, in terms of, or at least your responses, um, and that's terrible. But honestly, and this is more just my opinion, I found that um, 
shops that are moving a little bit quicker, the apps are a little bit uh, better, higher quality. You're talking about SOA services, or sorry, SOA architecture. Um, you know, you're talking about some of the, the, it's not just about the newer technology, but just, you know, the, the speed of development leads to something that's living and breathing and um, being improved on and iterated over in a much more, you know, expedient fashion than some huge monolithic legacy app written in code that only like, you know, uh, certain people have, you know, the ability to develop in. Um, so, I mean, I, I do, I would agree with you guys that, that is a benefit of folks that are in this environment and that the, the speed aspect, I've never heard anyone say um, that the speed aspect is actually a, uh, uh, a benefit for, for security. Um, that's an interesting, I mean, for me anyways, that's a very interesting uh, a point, but it does sound like the, like, sorry, speed takes a, uh, uh, speed, speed's a big factor in, in, you know, between waterfall and uh, agile. Um, <clears throat> so we've got... <laughs> something to interject right there. Uh, you talked about, like, being able to contribute to any project. You know, these, these, these faster-moving shops typically you know, have more mature development cycles and things like that. One thing I think that really works well at GitHub is that, you know, every project has a script that says, get me up and running so I can develop locally. So if we find a bug in any one of our applications, I can probably fix it within like 10 minutes and have it deployed. And that's just amazing. And that's just not from the deploy side. It's also from the local development side. You know, I have one. You know, give me, uh, give sorry. Me running, give me running so I can develop locally. It's a lot to type. Neil, you might think about shortening that. Script bootstrap. How about that? There you go. There you go. So we've got about seven minutes left, and there's one question that uh, I am curious about because we have not. So we've talked a lot about agile and continuous development, um, and a little bit about DevOps. Um, so you know, from my standpoint, one of the biggest challenges for a security person with DevOps is that you have software developers um, who have the ability to actually spin up infrastructure, and um, everybody's got their own opinions on that. But you know, ha has anyone addressed that on this call? Has anyone, um, you know? put things into place like we've talked about with code to actually detect um, or, you know, put some parameters around what infrastructure is built, how it's built um, and monitoring or anything of that nature. And if so, can you, can you speak to it? Uh, well, having worked at Rackspace where you kind of tripped over virtual servers on the way into the office, um, <laughs> <laughs> we had a lot of that going on. Um, and the way we addressed it was to do, I think the smart play is, and, and I had the luxury of having uh, some good ops people that were doing, well, it depended on the team, but it was either Salt, Chef, Puppet, or Ansible. Um, whichever one they were doing, though, their configuration management was checked into an internal GitHub. And so what we would do as a security team is bless a release or a tag or a, or a branch, depending on the team, honestly. Um, but we would bless a particular version of a deploy script. And once it was blessed, like, launch as many of those hardened servers as you want. I don't really care because I know they're hardened. Um, and then the, the other thing you can do is if you can talk the uh, ops or dev or whichever, whoever is doing this deployment into dropping an agent, onto those boxes that basically is a narc. I love the idea of a read-only agent that kind of looks around and says, this is the state of this box and ships that answer back to a mothership. Um, that kind of model is perfect because as you scale up or down, you know, you either get more or less uh, little agents talking back to the mothership from a particular product team. Um, it, it, it is a way that you can in enable and it frees the, the dev or the ops, whoever's doing these deploys, it frees them to do deploys as much or as little as they need um, and it gives the security team pretty good confidence that what they're deploying is sane. Um, the other thing we did is we would wire into the uh, GitHub accounts so that we would get alerts if they changed basically anything in a, in a version. If they do a merge into a version to change a setting, like we'll get a diff of that and say, wait a minute, oh, you're, oh, you're doing that? Fine, that's a nothing. Right? Because after that initial review, it's that, like Neil was saying, it's all down to differential analysis. Like, look at the diffs. Oh, they added this little bit to their Ansible? That doesn't do anything that I personally care about. They just needed to move a file over or chamod something that's unimportant. Super. Done. Have fun. Yeah, I like the, I like the Netflix uh, answer on this. Uh, Jason uh, Chan uh, um, said this at LastCon a few years back, um, that... Um, 
they they have a kind of a known known image, known whatever that they say, like hey, you're, you're allowed to use. And and Netflix is you know decentralized uh, management, right? So it, the rule is not you have to use it. It's you're allowed to use whatever the heck you want to do and do whatever you want to do. But um, if you use this one, like your life will be you know considerably easier, right? And so it sort of helps um, guide people to to the right known state. Um, also, I know Chef released a, a thing, uh, I guess it was like last April, uh, you can run Chef in audit mode and, and check like CIS hardening guidelines, you know, against um, against an instance that way. Um, so, you know, that way when you're getting like PCI audit or whatever, you can say, oh, no, we, we don't just check our hardening, you know, every every uh, every year, we check it every, you know, night or on you know, some sort of cadence that, that makes sense for you, you know, using Jenkins and firing up that way. So, I, I, I feel like there's... Um, there's a couple like hacks that you can do, kind of in the new the new uh, era, right? But I, I think your your point, James, about putting some some uh, costs in there. You know, I did a similar thing unrelated to DevOps, but uh, we had when I worked at TEA, it was an education agency, K through 12 for Texas. Lots of SSNs, because that's kind of how you track kids, unfortunately. <laughs> and so we made a requirement that if you use an SSN and it's not salted hashed where you're just doing matching, it's actually storing an SSN. Here is this big laundry list of things you must do. But you're welcome to do it. We're not telling you no, but here's the cost. Or if you, you know, salted hash it and you're just using it for comparison purposes, here's a significantly shorter list. And it's amazing when you have those conversations with PMs or whomever and say, we're not saying no, but if you do that, here's the things you have to do. And I imagine with Netflix, it's the same with that image, right? It's pre-configured to talk to their monitoring. It's pre-configured to you know, talk to all the different bits that they needed to talk to. Or you can roll your own. Well, come on, I'm busy. I'd rather use the pre-built one. Yep, put the right incentives in place. Yep, huge. Well, um, I'm going to verify that we don't have um, uh, any other um, questions here. Um, it doesn't look like we do. Uh, I've kind of thrown in those questions as they've, as they've come up to you guys. Um, uh, but uh, anyways, so um, I guess we'll sort of uh, wrap things up at this point since we're about to hit an hour. I honestly feel like we this this could, could have been a easily a two hour conversation. Um, so uh, you know, thank you everybody for for um, giving me your thoughts and. Uh, so yeah, thank you, uh, panelists, for sure. I appreciate it. Um, and as I mentioned before, the recording will be up on setcast.com within the next couple of days for you attendees. Please don't forget to fill out that survey as we end it. Um, any uh, parting thoughts anyone wants to share before we uh, we close this out? All right. Well, thanks again, folks. I really do appreciate it. I'm, I'm sure our audience appreciated it. Um, so, uh, you know, thanks again. Appreciate it. Hey, thanks so much for having us. Thanks a lot. Thank awesome. you very much. Thanks. All right, bye.